The first experience happened a few months ago. I was in my sophomore year and was preparing for my teaching practicum. Anyway, it was sometime close to two or after two in the morning. I was writing my lesson plans with the lights off, so the only light from my laptop lit up the room. I was at it for a few hours due to idling on YouTube, but when I was almost at the end, I suddenly felt uneasy, as if someone was in the room watching me. When I looked up, my attention was averted to the door, which was right in front of me. At first, I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me due to prolonged exposure to my laptop screen. But when I really looked closely, I saw a shadow forming right in front of me. I was confused at first and was saying to myself, what the fuck is that? Then it dawned on me what was happening and I was like, oh shit. It began manifesting itself and was forming into this shadow man, if you would call it that. I proceeded to continue my work as to not allow it to know I knew it was there. But the atmosphere got more and more uncomfortable till I was fixated on its only. I watched it for a few minutes as it just stood there not moving until it just disappeared. The moment I got the opportunity to move, I quickly got up and flicked on the light and obviously nothing there. I stayed with the light on for the rest of the night. The second incident happened a few weeks ago. I was trying to get some sleep but was unable to no matter how hard I tried. Eventually I dozed off and began dreaming this weird dream. I tried to wake up and I did. Well, so I thought. Apparently I tried twice and when I thought I was awake, I was still in this dream state and couldn't move or talk or even scream out. I knew someone or something was behind me, but to be honest, I wasn't going to take the chance and look what was there. For context, my back was to the same door I saw the shadow figure. I felt this electric charge the whole time running through my body, and then my eyes went shut, and I couldn't open them, no matter how hard I tried. This woman then came over to me. Mind you, my eyes were shut, but it was as if I could see her, even though it was happening. How is this possible? She then tried to lift me off my bed to carry me to God knows where and I tried to put a counter force on her, not allowing her to carry this out, whatever it was. This happened for the next five minutes, I believe, until she relented and I woke up in a panic, looking all around with nothing and no one in sight. Best believe it took a while to go back to sleep. Nothing has happened since, and I want to keep it that way. What are your thoughts on this? I hadn't thought about this in a while, until someone mentioned the hat man in response to a different post. And then I remembered, oh yeah, I've seen the hat man. I was living overseas at the time, and although I'd always been a pretty spiritual person, due to circumstances in my life, coupled with the people I was associating with, it went from zero to a hundred real quick. I won't get into all that, because this isn't really the place for it. But I think the fact that I was more in tune than I've ever been with myself and my surroundings has a lot to do with the following experiences. There was a lot happening, mainly in the form of hearing ringing bells when no bells were around, seeing angel numbers everywhere and constantly, and of course, the hat man. I worked the night shift at the time and weird stuff always happened to me when I've had to sleep during the day. The only times I've ever slept walk, had sleep paralysis, or seen things was when I was on nights. I'm sure the logical and scientific explanation for it is that my natural rhythms were all out of whack. And while I think that's true, I also think it made me more susceptible to things. So anyway, enough preamble. My alarm would go off every day at 4 p.m. Most of the time I'd wake up 30 minutes early and just lie in bed delaying the inevitable. Same thing happened the morning, afternoon in question, and I slowly woke up, lying on my back. I blearily opened my eyes, and there was enough ambient light coming in through the window that the room was decently well lit, 
think late afternoon light, kind of golden. As I slowly blinked awake, my eyes settled on the space at the foot of my bed. There was a TV stand there against the wall, and the top half of that should have been in my line of sight. Instead, there was the distinct shadowed form of a tall, broad-shouldered figure wearing a wide-brimmed hat. It startled me, and I instantly sat up in bed. But in the space of time it took me to realise what I was seeing and react, it disappeared. I told one of my friends about it later, and he told me it must have been the hat man. Stories and feelings seem to be pretty mixed on this character, but I can say that I felt no fear and had no bad feelings about seeing it. It startled me, obviously, but it didn't scare me. I saw the same figure once or twice more after that, and then never again. It's been years since it all happened, and even though I hadn't thought about it till seeing that comment, writing all of this out has brought it back clear as day. I'd love to hear other people's experiences, good or bad. What's your opinion of the hat man? Do you think it's a messenger, a guardian, a ghost, or something else entirely? My family and I were living in a big house out in the country, in the middle of nowhere, Illinois. When you pulled into the driveway, the house was to your left. The second floor of the house is where all three bedrooms were, plus a bathroom. From the driveway, looking at the second floor of the house, you would see a row of windows that was the hallway connecting the bedrooms, with the bathroom in the center, across from the row of windows. This hallway always gave me the creeps. I can't explain why, it just felt evil. I hated that hallway. I hated reaching the top of the stairs. I hated the few steps it took from the top of the stairs to get to my bedroom. I hated showering in that bathroom. The downstairs bathroom only had a tub, no shower. While showering, I always felt that I had to watch the door, glass doors. I hated that when I pulled into the driveway, that I felt I had to look at that row of windows to the hallway, I guess to make sure that nothing was there. Anyway, just all round creepy hallway. One night, my husband and I were laying in bed. We had just laid down, completely awake. It's pitch black, no lights on in the house, no street lights or cars in the road. We were surrounded by cornfields. You can tell if a car is coming by the headlights a mile down the road. After a couple minutes, my eyes had adjusted to the dark. I could make out my doorway, the dresser, etc. I was looking toward the doorway when I saw the shadow of a large man enter the bedroom, walk across the room, then disappear. I had read about shadow people before, but didn't really believe the stories. I just couldn't understand what people meant when they said it was blacker than black, until that moment. After a few seconds, I said to my husband, did you see that? Not being specific about what I saw because I wanted to know if he saw the same thing. With a shake in his voice, all he said was, I don't want to talk about it. And I knew he did. We didn't discuss it until the next morning. He described the exact same thing I saw. We moved a few months later, unrelated reasons. But I've never missed that house. About a year and a half ago, my husband and I were temporarily separated. My teenage daughter and I had moved into an apartment. We were on good terms and he had the access code to get into the apartment. After I had gone to bed one night, I heard the door open and close. I propped up on my elbows to look out of my bedroom door, down the hallway, into the living room, where I saw my husband standing. I asked him, what are you doing? He was looking at me, but didn't reply and turned and walked into the kitchen. I thought, whatever, and laid back down and went to sleep. The next morning I called him and asked him what he wanted last night. He said, what do you mean? I replied, what did you want when you came over last night? To this day, he swears he didn't come over. 
my daughter and I moved back into our house about a year ago. Last week, I was in the shower and heard my husband coughing inside the bathroom. I hadn't heard the door open. I said, Jesus, you scared the shit out of me. Again, no reply, and I heard the door close. After I got out of the shower and dressed, I went to the living room where he was. I asked him what he wanted. Again, I got a, what are you talking about? I said, you came into the bathroom while I was in the shower. He told me he never got off the couch. Then last night, we were both sitting on the couch right next to the door when the doorbell rang. This doorbell isn't just a two note type of ding dong. My husband set it to play the dang national anthem. So it played the whole thing. As soon as it started, he got up and opened the door to, you guessed it, no one. He even went outside and looked around the house. Nothing. I don't think he believed in seeing and hearing him. After the doorbell thing, I think he's a little spooked. Ah, the snow. How delicate and unique each flake of the cold, white substance can be. The children will dash through it, flinging it left and right among each other. They will lay down and stretch their arms and legs in all directions, attempting to create a beautiful angel for all to see. Then, of course, there are others who build snowmen, their laughter filling the frosty air as they partake in a multitude of holiday activities. How I envied those who enjoyed the Christmas spirit. I had never actually seen such festivities occur. Rather, I would hear about them through tales my father would tell of the good boys and girls who truly valued what it meant to celebrate Christmas. I know, I know. It isn't that close to Christmas yet. Just bear with me. This needs to come out in advance for reasons that will soon become apparent. This story will be a recounting of an experience I had as a young boy. After finding myself away from my childhood home and stumbling upon civilization, I began taking the time to recollect a few memories from my past. Between strange occurrences I couldn't explain back then and one freakish moment I experienced at some point in time, I suppose this will act as a warning to you. I truly want to help you and this is perhaps the best way I can spread the word about what I have discovered without him finding out. I need to be discreet about this. I don't think he'd be too fond of me releasing this information. Although I have traveled as far away from my old home as I can, I know for a fact that he's still out there and that he can find me if I'm clumsy. Sure, this shitty VPN might do the trick for a while, but something tells me that a man like him can bypass such a thing in time. Maybe, maybe if a few people who see this help me spread it around, I won't have to worry as much. Maybe if there's enough of us telling this story, he won't be able to pick me out of the crowd. It's the best I can hope for, I suppose. Even still, I have to live the life of a nomad, never once being able to stop and catch my breath. Now, since I finished my introduction, I suppose it's time to release something I've been holding back for quite some time now. I can only hope that I make any sort of difference by doing this. My childhood was a strange one. When December came, I found myself locked inside my house. My father and I didn't adorn the halls with stockings or decorations, nor did we erect a Christmas tree in our living room. The fireplace was constantly extinguished robbing me of the comfort I desired. Each night, I would curl up in bed, trembling as the cold air ran across my body, and I stared up at the ceiling, my mind completely blank. Yes, it was as bad as it sounds. No, I didn't mind how rough things could get. There always seemed to be an innocent part of me that didn't mind the way I lived my life. No matter how barren the house could be during all times of the year, don't get me wrong, my father was very good to me. I can't recall a day he didn't show me his wide smile and treat me as best he could. He took care of me, fed me well, and was a good parent overall. He was a rather direct fellow, but a kind man nonetheless. The only issue is that, well, he wasn't a big fan of the holidays. 
This made for a very bleak life around the winter time, especially. I was surprised to hear that December was a time of celebration for many other people. My father told me that it was the month where people came together. They would hang decorations in their house, light warm fires in the fireplace, and carry jovial expressions on their face as they feasted come supper time. I often thought he did it just to pull my leg. I had never seen the things he described to me after all, so it would make sense that maybe they were just stories. I rarely found it strange that we didn't live remotely near anybody else. Our small wooden hut was located high in the mountains, where the slopes would be treacherous for anyone ascending or descending the terrain. Perhaps, even if I had wanted to see the outside world, I wouldn't have been able to. It would have been impossible for me to climb up or down the rugged area, let alone at such a young age. Because of the sheer height of the mountains where we lived, the air was thin and the winds blew fiercely, and the most I ever saw of the outside world was through the window. While my father stayed inside with me, we would play board games and create drawings together. Those and various other indoor activities would teach me about the outside world and what it was like. However, my favorite memories of my father were the stories he would tell me. As mentioned prior, he would tell me of his experiences with that which dwelled under the mountain and across the world. His various interactions with such people piqued my curiosity and upon my request to learn more, he would bring me books and magazines. Those sources were my first true contact with society and I'd spent hours at a time reading. It kept me busy and Despite the lack of holiday cheer in my life, I was content. As each December came, my father would start spending less time with me and more time in his private office. I only ever saw him carrying a large list of what appeared to be names on a sheet, and then he would vanish for lengthy periods of time. I always wondered what he did up there, but he never took the time to explain. He always brushed off my questions or dismissed them with a simple, You'll understand when you're older, kiddo. I never found myself content with those answers. For years, I felt as if my thirst for knowledge would remain unquenched, for the simple reason that I hadn't a clue what my father did. After mischievously trying to sneak into his office one night while he slept, I found that the door was locked, and I never found the key. With my determination fleeting, I decided to just mind my own business and let it be. Several years of this same pattern would come and go, and I was fine with it at first. However, I was not fine with the repetitive and quite frankly, monotonous routine. I had read all my books, perfected all my art, and it got to the point where my father would retell the same old stories. I grew tired of these tedious rituals, and thus my curiosity sparked once more. It had been years since I'd learned about the existence of my father's office, I thought that perhaps I was old enough to handle what was inside. You could imagine my dismay upon being denied my request to enter the room. I must have asked that man several times a month. Still, with his everlasting patience, he would respond with a simple no each time. With all of this information out of the way, I think it's time I introduce you to something my father would do that would eventually cause my curiosity to overflow. You see, every night on December 24th, he would open the front door, a large brown bag slung over his shoulder. He'd wave goodbye to me with a jolly grin on his face. He'd release a cheerful laugh before closing the door and locking it behind him, making his merry way down the mountain with inhuman speed and skill before disappearing into the night. The following day, he would come back exhausted. After taking his bag to the office, he would then sleep for most of the day. I may have been an ignorant child, but I wasn't stupid. All the books I had read, all the stories I had heard, they connected like puzzle pieces together within my young brain. And I came to conclude that my father was, in fact, Santa Claus. I knew then more than ever that I had to find out what was in his office. So I formulated a devious plan within my mind and decided it was worth a shot. After a few hours of waiting, I saw the sun begin to rise above the horizon. The snowy weather had ceased on the mountain, and the morning was a calm one indeed. I struggled to keep my eyes open. 
I had waited all night for my father to return home. After a while, I felt my body begin to relax. I fought with all my strength to keep my eyes open, and right before I drifted into a sound sleep, I heard the front door open. I peeked my head up and fixated my eyes on the shape of my father, stepping through the doorway. He looked surprised to see me up so early, but he flashed me that same warm smile he always did and rubbed my head gently. As expected, he ascended the stairs and opened his office door. He told me to wait outside and not to look in, and I obliged his request. As he exited the room and closed the door, I stopped him before he could lock it with his key. I quickly grabbed his arm and pulled him downstairs. He tugged back towards the door in protest, but I was persistent, and he eventually gave in and followed me willingly. I led him to the kitchen, where a fresh batch of cookies awaited him, accompanied by a glass of milk. He smiled and thanked me before digging in, frantically eating the cookies and drinking his milk. After he finished, he wiped his mouth with his sleeve and got up. I could see the bags under his eyes and the tired expression on his face. With a single yawn, he went to his room and fell asleep in bed. My plan had succeeded. I steadily made my way up the stairs and found myself in front of the office. Sweat pooled in my palms as I gripped the doorknob before me. Years of waiting and curiosity would be satisfied and the mystery would finally be solved. I snickered softly. Finally, a little action. A vacation from the curiosity which had plagued me for so long. I trembled in excitement and I pushed the door open and opened. A single desk stood in the middle of the room and the brown bag sat on top of it. I slowly approached the desk, placing my hand on the bag. With one swift motion, I opened it and poked my head inside. Its contents weren't exactly what I had expected. What I saw in that bag left me scratching my head in confusion. Inside, I found what seemed to be a random assortment of objects at the time. I was disappointed with my findings, and I carefully made sure to exit the door and close it behind me, certain that I'd covered my tracks well. I never spoke a word of that experience to my father. I found myself chuckling a few times at how underwhelmed I was. I was expecting something far greater only to find a strange collection of items inside the bag. Perhaps I laughed it off to distract myself from the truth of what I saw, but I convinced myself that my dad was nobody special all along. It wasn't until I got much older, I began thinking about what I found and what it truly meant. When the realization finally hit me, I soon after fled from my home. My body has grown acclimated to the environment I'd lived in, And one Christmas after my old man left the house, I was able to descend the mountain much like my father had and run far, far away. The items I had found that day, they corresponded with several of the objects kept in the possession of a certain Germanic legend. It was a folklore tale spread around regarding an entity that made itself known come Christmas. I had read a little about it in the various magazines and books my father had retrieved from me years ago. I saw chains, coal, birch branches, rope and branding irons. Each one had been used the previous night and several child sized shoes were also contained within the sack. All of them charred beyond repair. When I woke up, I only recognized the growing sense of thirst from within my dehydrated body. I licked my parched lips and slipped out in the covers, my body suddenly hit by the cold air stitched into the seams of the oppressive darkness ahead. I quivered as I reluctantly embraced the chill temperature and made my way to the door, jumping with each step as small creaks were produced from the weight of my foot being placed upon the oak floorboards. Although the noise was faint, it sounded deafeningly loud in contrast to the dead silence surrounding my petite self. All five of my fingers curled around the bronze-coloured doorknob ahead, and they steadily turned it until a small click was heard. I then placed my tiny hand against the wooden door 
coated in a fine layer of white paint. And with a gentle push, the barrier between the safe haven of a child's bedroom and whatever lay beyond was removed. I shivered as a new draft of icy air entered the room. A brand new wave of darkness seemed to rush through the doorway and engulf the area, its color resembling that of tar. Summoning all the courage I could, I placed both feet firmly on the beige carpet that embellished the ground. My eyes glared at the corridor before me. It appeared lengthier at night than during the day. I could imagine elongated arms melting from the walls on both sides, grasping at my clothing. I could envision dozens of spiders dropping from the ceiling, several landing on my hair, and others crawling on the surface of my body. Shaking my head, I banished such thoughts and proceeded down the hallway. The hair on the back of my neck stood up as I walked past the room where my parents soundly rested in their comfortable bed. There was no turning back, and even if I wanted to. The craving for a drink to sedate my ever-growing dehydration only grew. I carried on still, finally reaching the end of the endless path and found myself in a clearing. By then, my eyes had grown somewhat accustomed to the dark, and I could make out a few pieces of furniture and a television set. I slowed my pace and gulped nervously. A sense of peril entrenched the room. I found that shadows would dance in the corner of my eyes, only to disappear once I turned my head in their direction. The darkness seemed even more foreboding than it had just seconds earlier. I desperately wished to run to my parents like I had so many times before. Still, I remembered how they had always told me there was nothing to be afraid of. They explained numerous times that my young imagination would always come up with ways to scare me, but I had to learn to be brave and overcome the fear I would often encounter at the hands of my own mind. Thus, my mind was set on proving to my mother and father that I wasn't afraid anymore. And so I carried on. I confidently walked forward, repeating what my parents had said in my thoughts with each stride. After taking a few steps, I heard it. From behind me, I could make out the sound of footsteps, their rhythm conflicting with my own. As I stopped, so did they. My heart began beating faster than before. Has it been my mind playing tricks on me again? I resumed my steady pace, and this time... The only footsteps I could hear were my own. As I neared the kitchen, I found myself standing completely still once more. Figures and shapes yet again found themselves located in the corners of my eyes. I attempted to take a few deep breaths in order to calm down. It was just my imagination, right? I tried my hardest to assure myself of that, but somewhere in the back of my mind, I doubted it and that growing sense of fear showed as I walked even faster. I kept my eyes focused ahead, not daring to look behind me for even a second. The offbeat footsteps returned once again, and I responded by going even faster. I felt the wind start to pick up and brush by my face as I realized how quickly I was moving. I was certain that my imagination was causing me to hear the footsteps on my trail, and the forms appearing in the corners of my eyes. I was aware that my imagination was the reason behind my deepest, darkest fears, which were beginning to make their presence known within his soul. I knew for a fact that only my imagination could make my heart beat the way it did and soak my palms in a thin layer of sweat. My parents would never lie to me, would they? Regardless of what I knew to be true or not, I was close to arriving at my destination. I began a full sprint as I felt the darkness clutching my ankles and arms. I could hear the footsteps aimlessly walking around and more illusions of figures accompanied them. I had one hell of an imagination and I had one thought racing through my mind. I needed to find a light switch. I was desperate for light that would illuminate my surroundings driving back the treacherous night and whatever creatures lived within it. Their sole purpose in life to capture me and munch on my bones. I was so close, just a few feet away. I leaped forward and pushed a small lever upwards, 
soaking me in the area in a warm, much appreciated glow. I sighed deeply and relieved to be out of danger at last. However, before I could even move, my heart stopped and my eyes widened. Behind me, I heard a voice most unfamiliar. It was rough, guttural and moist, and it echoed throughout the entire house. Finally, I can see you. I flicked off the lights before letting out a shrill cry. I dashed through the darkness, through the living room, the hallway, all the way to my parents' room. Though I can't be certain, I, I swear I could hear the faint sound of childish giggling from behind me. My parents were frustrated that I had awoken them, but I didn't care in the slightest. I clung to my mother, sobbing into her chest. My father didn't find anything in the house. He searched every nook and cranny of the place, only to confirm his suspicions that we were the sole occupants. My parents let me sleep with them that night. I knew that no matter what I said, they would simply chalk my experience up to being a consequence of a hyperactive mind. But I knew, I knew there was something with me. I knew beyond any doubt that the breathing I felt on the back of my neck and that deep perverted voice was all real. Looking back, I feel almost silly that I was afraid of the dark. We were never afraid of the dark. Rather, it was what was in the dark that petrified us to our core. It was the knowledge that the only thing separating us from a potentially cruel, twisted fate was the thin veil of darkness surrounding us. on a Saturday evening. They say that there are some moments in our life that we'll remember for an eternity. Events that we find are branded into our minds, whether we like it or not. We say that we recall these moments down to the minutest detail, and I can attest to that theory quite well. The clear water droplets plummeted from above, splashing onto the windshield. Cars traveled alongside the vehicle their headlights illuminating the rain, and the night sky contained thousands of dazzling stars above. Inhale. My chest rose, my lungs taking in crisp air from the slightly opened window beside me. I turned my head, my eyes meeting with hers, and then falling about her gorgeous teeth and her rose lips. Exhale. My gaze fixated on my rear view mirror, Observing my young boy strapped firmly in the back seat, fast asleep. Inhale. My eyes grew wide as the high beams flooded my vision. In an instant, I launched my foot toward the brake, clenching my teeth hard, jaw locked firmly shut. The sound of metal colliding terrorized my ears, and my car's momentum carried us forward. Glass shattered as the vehicle came to a violent halt, causing my body to jerk forward and my face to plant directly into the steering wheel. Two shrieks, one from beside me and one from behind erupted into the night. They died down as soon as they began and suddenly there was no sound at all. My body was rendered immobile and my eyesight faded away, yet my lips still functioned. They gently parted, but all I could squeak squeak out was a measly no before darkness overwhelmed me. From that point on, I vaguely recall the noisy sound of bustling people and being in a white corridor. Beaming lights shone overhead, beckoning for me. I tried reaching out towards it, yet I couldn't move my arms. My eyes fluttered and I once more drifted away into sleep. I would stay in the hospital for several weeks, recovering from various fractures and undergoing multiple surgeries. My body ached yet my physical pain could not compare to my worries about my family. Although I felt a relief like no other wash over me when the staff informed me that my son had survived, a familiar sense of dread later overtook me as I learned my wife was in critical condition. Those nights took an eternity to pass. I consistently glanced towards the clock on the wall, observing the hands tick by minute by minute. Tears would claw their way from my eyes at strange hours of the day, 
drenching my cheeks in moisture until my cheeks burned red, and the sweats forming in my palms dampened the bedsheets I'd clenched. Each time one of the staff or doctors came into my room, my vision darted toward them. I knew they could read my mind. They would give me this pitiful look when they looked into my pleading eyes. Every time I asked, they would give me the same non-answer. I assure you, Mr. Johnson, we are doing our best to treat your wife. Every day I met with some variation of this response. Yet I persisted, determined to hear that my wife would be okay. Until one day, one of the staff entered my room. Shakily standing up to greet him, I grinned and extended my arm towards his. That's when I noticed the sullen look plastered on his face and my heart descended below my chest. He spoke calmly, methodically, each word exiting his lips in slow motion. My knees quivered lightly at first and then more rapidly as he continued. As they eventually buckled, I collapsed to the floor, my chest furiously heaving, each breath I took growing more exasperated than the last. Several people restrained me and placed me back onto my bed. I think they were trying to give me words of encouragement and sympathy in the process, but whatever they said blended into an incoherent mess. The men and women beside me blurred into unrecognizable forms and I stared straight ahead. The abhorrently foul stench of perspiration dripping from every orifice of my body dug into my nose and pricked my eyes. My mind, blank as a paper, grew weary, and I finally gave in to the staff attempting to keep me still. The nurses helped clean me up shortly after following the outburst. After receiving fresh clothing and being given time and space to come to terms with the news, my nurse escorted me to the lobby. There he stood, waiting for me. I rushed towards him as quickly as possible, Stooping down, I embraced him, resting my chin on his scalp and gently patting his back. He buried his head into my chest. My shirt moistened and I held him even closer. He knew. Before we left the hospital, I received a few recommendations for psychiatrists and therapists in my area. After thanking the staff for all their help, my son and I took the bus back to our neighborhood later that night. We had baked chicken with rice that night, but he just sat there, poking his food with his fork. Sighing, I finished my plate, hoping it would inspire him to do the same. Instead, he pushed his dish away from him, in front of where an empty chair stood before the table. I knew he wouldn't budge, but I knew the hospital had been keeping him healthy and nourished. I told him he should go to bed and get some rest, and he obliged, hopping up from his seat and making his way to his room. After he crawled in bed, I tucked him in and asked him if he'd liked me to sleep in his room for the night. He shook his head, rejecting my offer. I bent down and kissed his forehead, wishing him a good night. I opened my laptop and researched the therapy centers cited in the pamphlet I received earlier. I grimaced when I read the costs for each one. My wife made money along with me for our family. That, combined with the opportunity cost forfeited by my hospital stay, took immediate therapy out of the question. Sighing, I closed the computer and trod over to my bedroom. Placing my palm against the wooden door, I traced my fingers along its perimeter until they met the cold brass knob. Counting down from five, I forced myself to open the door upon reaching zero. I set foot into the room flicking the light switch upward. As the bulb cast its light onto dull gray walls surrounding me, I mustered the courage to set one foot in front of the other. Making my way over to the oak frame of my queen-sized bed, I looked down upon the blankets before me. The bed felt so different. It felt so empty. Beside the bed sat a dresser with a picture frame placed atop it. There, stood a man and his soulmate, their faces beaming with glee. Feeling the tears trickling down my cheeks, I glanced back toward the bed, realizing I was dampening the sheets while I wept. Breathing in deeply, I turned and exited the room with haste. Retreating to the living room, I lay down on the couch, and after a few hours of tossing and turning, 
my body finally shut down and let me rest. I didn't recognise where I was. All I knew was that pure light surrounded me, overloading my senses. My mouth opened, yet I didn't make a sound. I extended my arm, groping ahead of me for whatever surface I could find. My figures were met with a wheel. The sound of an engine roared from somewhere within the light. Tires swerved and voices shrieked. Bang. Metal tearing into metal. Incoherent shrill cries produced from the back of the car. Was this truly happening again? My head jerked forward with the momentum of the vehicle. The commotion ceased as suddenly as it arrived, leaving me in a state of disarray. The cold night air seeped in through the shattered windows, erecting the hairs on my arms. Everything was still. It was a dream. I knew it was a dream. So why could I so vividly sense the beads of sweat trickling down my arms and pooling around my knuckles? How is it that a figment of my subconscious mind was able to perfectly replicate the texture of the leather-coated steering wheel, which I so desperately clung to? Internally, I knew what would greet me if I were to shift my gaze to my right. Then I felt it. The round object slumped against my shoulder. The messy strands of hair against my arm. The warm, liquid droplets falling and splashing against my hand. I couldn't even form a coherent thought before my attention shifted to the sudden weight pressed against my left shoulder. Five slender fingers held me in their grip. My head spun around in the opposite direction to observe who was touching me. Upon doing so, my gaze was met with an arm reaching through the shattered window. I tilted my head up, and before me stood a man. He stood tall, adorned with black jeans and a grey dress suit. His frame was much too small for his clothes, however. He appeared fragile. The skin on his arms seemed to loosely stretch over the bone underneath. It was as if he would disintegrate if even the slightest force were applied to him. Despite the situation around me, my body eased into the seat. I felt a sensation of relief wash over me. He carried an unexplainable aura of familiarity about him, even despite his malnourished frame. Even despite his lanky stature, even despite his face appearing to have been blurred out of existence entirely, I didn't fear him. It almost depressed me that my encounter with him was brief, as I awoke before my eyes scanned what should have been his face. It all happened so fast. I placed my hand on my left shoulder, running my fingertips along its surface. The imprint that would have been left by man was not there. Of course it wasn't. It was just a nightmare after all. I can't say for certain I understand what I dreamt of that night. It all felt so real. I didn't recognise the man I encountered either. So how could I possibly have felt such an intrinsic connection between him and I? Although I'm not sure what to make of it, I can't help but get the sneaking suspicion that there's more to this than I'm currently comprehending. After all, a dream is said to be a gateway into the subconscious. I felt a soft tugging on my beige shirt. The small hand of my boy gripped the polyester tightly. I placed my hand on his head, gently massaging his scalp and pulling him closer to me. The funeral service had occurred just hours prior. Our family wasn't particularly social. We had a few friends and family stop by and offer their condolences to me. It was nice, but if I'm honest, it didn't make me feel better in the slightest. Excuse me for feeling this way, but I wasn't exactly receptive to socialising at my wife's funeral. I only went out of necessity, as well as in pursuit of some form of closure. That closure never did arrive. After it was all said and done, the other attendees left, and it was just my son and I standing before her casket, all alone. I stepped forward, placing my hand on the wooden box. The casket sat on a platform. Roses and candles were placed near it on a table. It was a lovely setup, yet it didn't feel complete. I knew her body wasn't inside. Her mangled corpse couldn't be presented for an open casket funeral, so we planned on having her cremated and having her remains buried. I turned, preparing to leave. 
Before I could, something peculiar caught my attention. Thump. I spun around, eyeing the casket. Had I been hearing things? No. The only ones in the room were my son and I. I turned back to exit the room, only to find my boy had disappeared. Where had he gone? He couldn't have left the room. I hadn't heard any footsteps. Before I could call his name, I heard it again. Thump. I most definitely had not been imagining things. Sean, where are you, buddy? I called out, now aware of the anxiety bubbling within me. I heard no answer. Rather, the only thing I heard was a faint laugh coming from behind me, near the casket. I recognised that laugh. My breath got caught in my throat, and I spun around, facing the source of the noise. There she stood, her angelic presence seemingly illuminating the room. What the fuck, I uttered, staring ahead in disbelief. It was impossible. I have to be hallucinating, I muttered. Had I gone mad? I had been so wrapped up in my thoughts that I hadn't immediately noticed myself moving towards her. I extended my arms, resting them on her shoulders. Her red freckles adorned her face, having just enough opacity to be noticeable. She smiled, revealing her pearly white palette, whereupon her dimples appeared. It was her. She was standing before me, in the flesh. I wanted so desperately to speak, but I could only choke on my own words. She delicately placed her hand on me, the cold, smooth surface of her ring grazing my cheek. Lowering my arms to her waist, I held her against me. When gazing into her eyes, the rest of the world simply ceased to be. All that existed was her and I at that place, at that time. Gently, we swayed back and forth, like the leaves of a tree on a gusty autumn day. Rocking forward and backward, we held each other in our arms. Her skin was warm, and I became entrapped in her aura. My muscles relaxed, and soon enough, I was no longer conscious of our movements. My body went on autopilot as we danced to the beat of our hearts, conjoined as one. I was in heaven, for my love was alive again. I closed my eyes, smiling in contentment. Drip. I heard a wet splash. At the same time, liquid pulled onto my hand. Its warmth juxtaposed the suddenly cold surface I felt pressed against me. My eyes sprung open. The only lively eyes of Elizabeth were now sunken and dull. Her appearance was now ghoulish, and her skin appeared to stick closely to her bones. Looking down at my hands, I saw that they had been covered with blood. A large laceration covered the surface of her stomach, and the stench of charred flesh infiltrated my nostrils. I shoved her away from me and collapsed to the floor. I only had a split second to process what had happened before thick chunks of vomit erupted from my throat. I wish I had not met her gaze again. Her sweet smile had transformed into a sickening grin. She dragged herself towards me, leaving a streak of blood and pus in her path. I attempted to get up and stumble away from her, but to no avail. I felt nauseous and struggled to do anything besides clumsily shuffling away. I grimaced in pain as I felt her latch onto my arm, digging her yellowish rotten nails into my skin. She used her momentum to lunge at me, shoving me to the ground and landing on top of me. I screamed and I fought and I clawed at her, desperate to get her off of me. Somehow, even though her body appeared rotten and broken, she overpowered me, scraping and clawing at my flesh. Then, I felt a tug on my beige shirt. A tiny hand gripped the polyester fabric. I picked myself up from the floor and looked down at my son. He looked back up at me, a look of concern and fear on his face. A puddle of vomit and tears occupied the floor beside where I had collapsed. Did I imagine everything? No, I quickly realised that wasn't the most important question at the time. Had my boy witnessed what had just happened? How could I have allowed myself to appear so weak in front of him? A boy is meant to see his father as a superhero, a strong man who can persevere through anything. Not only had that persona collapsed in the hospital, but it collapsed here as well. What would he think of me? 
Regret and dismay ran through my veins at that moment, but those feelings were interrupted as Sean embraced me with as much strength as, a, as his little arms could muster. I froze and then gently reciprocated his embrace. He had seen me collapse, seen me cry, seen me at my most vulnerable. Yet, when I looked upon my son, comforting me when I needed it most, I didn't see a child who felt disappointed in his father. All I saw was an act of compassion. Not wanting to weep any more than I already had, I let go of Sean and stood upright. He was only a child and had suffered already the loss of his mother. At such a young age, I doubted he had much understanding of the concept of death at all. But I knew for certain he missed Elizabeth, and so I knew I had to be there for him. I promised then and there that I would be strong for Sean. We arrived home that evening. I treated Sean to the best pot roast I could make, and was ecstatic to see he had finally regained his appetite. I tucked him into bed soon after. I brought a chair by his bed, pulling his sheets and covers over him. The lamp by his bedside shone brightly. You doing okay, little guy? I inquired. He didn't respond, of course. He hadn't uttered as much as a word since the incident. I didn't understand why, but I didn't want to press him on it, either. I would get him some help as soon as I could. I grabbed his stuffed teddy bear from a nearby shelf and waved it in front of him. You remember how we got this? How we went to the fair last year and you played the baseball game and won Teddy? I had hoped bringing up this memory would, would elicit a response from Sean, but he simply smiled and continued to look at me. Sighing, I returned his smile and patted his head. When Mommy and I got married, we knew we wanted a baby. Every night, we would pray to the angels that a baby boy would come. And one day, you came to us. It was the happiest day of our lives, Sean. And from that point onward, you made us the happiest parents around. Mom, won't be along for a long time. I promise that she's watching you with the angels. And she's smiling, Sean. She's so, so proud of her beautiful baby boy. And so am I. We will always love you. Again, Sean's lips never parted once. Yet I knew that he understood. He had to have understood. I just know it. I just wanted to hear his voice again. Good night, Sean, I said, getting up to leave his room. Before I could, he reached out and grabbed my arm. Oh, right. Sorry, buddy, I said, leaning over and kissing his forehead. He nodded his head in satisfaction and lay down. I turned off his lamp and closed his bedroom door. Making my way to the bathroom, I went inside and stared into the mirror. I had kept my promise to myself to stay strong for Sean, at least for tonight. I gripped the sink tightly, leaning over and peering into my reflection. What the hell happened earlier? Could it have been related to the dream I had the other night? Why was I experiencing these disturbing visions? I had never really had to deal with mental trauma in the past, so I was unfamiliar with how to process this information. If people knew about the experiences I was having, would they think I was crazy? For the first time in my life, I felt small and out of control. I balled my hand into a fist, pounding it into the wall. That night was a sleepless one. All I could do was look up at the ceiling. Empty thoughts occupied my mind. I couldn't make any sense of what I had experienced, so I merely dismissed them as nightmares. I'll keep you guys updated on any future developments. I need an outlet to get my thoughts out. I don't want to vent to my son, so I'll type my thoughts here. Thank you for your attention. I appreciate it. Another update. I found it hard to eat recently. Besides the pork roast I had with Sean, I haven't had much of an appetite for anything. I've lost quite a bit of weight, evident by my rapidly thinning frame. I haven't been sleeping well either. Despite this, I've been giving my best efforts to stay strong. I truly believe Sean and I will get through this. When Sean fell asleep during the evening, I decided for the first time in a while to try diving again. I'd been walking or using public transport to get from place to place, but I knew that I couldn't just avoid driving forever. We had taken Liz's car that night, so I was able to use mine. I went out to the driveway and entered my vehicle. 
I put the keys into the ignition, slowly turning it until I could hear the hum of the engine. Taking a deep breath, I shifted the gear into reverse and backed out of the driveway. Deciding I would get off to a slow start, I drove through my neighborhood streets at a low speed. The car methodically made its way down the road and I eased up a little. I was getting comfortable driving again. Mustering up a little more courage, I turned onto a public road so I could practice driving among other vehicles again. My hands started to tremble, so I gripped the wheel tightly. I turned on my hazard lights. I needed to pace myself and keep my cool. I applied a little more pressure to the accelerator. My body stiffened as the car picked up speed and I responded by slowly my breathing. Doing so allowed me to loosen my body and I pressed down on the accelerator even harder. I lowered the windows and felt the wind blow against my face. Horns beeped all around me. The noise of chattering pedestrians and restaurant music was omnipresent. I remembered the feeling of driving down the road at night in my car. The way the breeze flowed through my hair. The way the paved roads felt underneath my tire. As I looked into my rearview mirror, I almost thought my eyes were betraying me. I was smiling. Not just a smirk, but a full-on grin. I released my grip on the wheel and simply drove. For miles I travelled, not having a care in the world. Oh, how I missed cruising along towards the horizon. That liberating feeling coated me in pure bliss. As darkness enveloped the environment, I flicked on my headlights. Peering into the night sky, I saw the millions of stars sparkling above. Momentarily pausing to appreciate the serene view, my attention was drawn to an alternative source of light ahead of me. The headlights of another vehicle were rapidly approached. I defaulted back to clutching the wheel. Those lights. They flooded my vision just as memories flooded my mind. Remembering to be calm, I once more inhaled a surplus of oxygen, letting it stir in my stomach before a prolonged exhale exited my nose. For a moment, the light covered my entire vehicle. In a split second, it was over. I observed my rearview mirror once more, watching the car travel down the road behind me. Pulling onto the shoulder, I put the car into park and leaned back into the seat. I let out an audible sigh of relief, followed by a single sentence. I did it. Returning home later that night, I quietly entered my house and went to check on Sean. His door opened with a slight creak and I made my way over to his bedside. I turned on his lamp, only to find the covers of an empty bed pulled to the side. Confused, I exited his room and called out his name. There was no response. The door had been locked when I arrived, so I knew he had to have been in the house. I checked the kitchen and the dining room before making my way to the hallway. The walls were coated in a darkness as black as tar, except for the very end of the hall. There stood the door to my bedroom, the glow of lights outlining its perimeter. I approached it, placing my hand on the doorknob and entering the room. There sat my son on my bed. In his arms sat a picture frame that held the image of Elizabeth, standing by Sean. He stared at the image, his face as still as stone. I went over to him, sitting by his side and placing my arm over his shoulder. I noticed dark splotches on the picture frame. Placing my hand under Sean's chin, I lifted his head to face me. Red circles surrounded his watery eyes. Using my thumb to wipe the remaining tears from his cheek, I tried to offer him the best smile I could, but his frown remained. There I sat, at a loss for words. My gaze lowered and focused on the picture in the frame. Placing my hand on his, we sat in silence and viewed the photo together. Eventually, I broke the silence, realising just how late it was. Hey buddy, let's head to bed, okay? Sean gave me a head nod and a rose, traversing the corridors of the house to his room. I tucked him in, as per usual, before retreating to my bed. I picked up the picture frame and held it in my hand. Elizabeth was as beautiful as ever, and for the first time in ages, viewing her did not cause me distress or pain. Rather, I felt a sense of acceptance. I recalled what I had told Sean, 
about her watching over him with the rest of the angels. Though I had said it to ease his mind, I too had begun to tell myself the same thing. That somewhere out there in the universe, my Liz was watching, hoping for the best for me. I glanced at the image of Sean, standing by his mother. He had the purest grin on his face. One that could melt my heart one thousand times over. I knew he did, because I remembered taking that photo. Yet, that was not how he appeared now. In his place stood a different Sean. A Sean without the grin. Without the energetic and hopeful eyes. Rather, one with deep gashes and bruises embedded into his flesh. One whose limbs appeared contorted into unnatural positions. In the blink of an eye, his happy demeanour changed into one of shock and terror. Taken aback, I dropped the photo and rushed back to Sean's room. I burst through the door, only to find him peacefully asleep in his bed. He was there, alive, in one piece. I saw him with my own two eyes. Making my way back to my bedroom, I scooped up the picture frame and gazed upon it once more. There he stood, looking perfectly happy. Rubbing my eyes in hopes to clear my vision, I viewed the image again, hoping to confirm that what I saw was real. The photo remained unchanged, still showing Sean as the gleeful little boy I knew him to be. I put the photo away and climbed into bed, pulling the covers over my body. Sinking my head into my pillow, I closed my eyes. Although it took a few hours, I finally drifted into a deep slumber. The following day, I woke up early. Entering the kitchen for a glass of water, the sound of footsteps caught my attention. They were heading down the hallway which led to Sean's room. Figuring Sean had woken up, I followed them down the hallway, where I saw his bedroom door ajar. Inside, I found my boy sitting beside the being from my dream all those nights ago. There he was, in his slick grey suit. He appeared as malnourished as ever, his thin frame giving him a feeble look. His face remained blurred, so much so that I couldn't discern any of his features. I watched as he extended his bony fingers towards my son, laying them atop his head. He brushed Sean's hair with his hand. Neither one of them faced me, and despite the circumstances, I didn't feel fear for my safety or Sean's. I walked towards the creature, attempting to touch it. Mere centimetres before the tips of my finger grazed its body, my body lunged forward, my forehead drenched in sweat. I observed my surroundings, realised I hadn't yet left my bed. Sean, I need you to speak to me. I must have uttered several variations of that phrase for at least half an hour. Please, buddy, you can talk to me, okay? I promise you can talk to Papa. No matter how many times I repeated these words to him, he simply wouldn't answer. I desperately needed to know that he could speak. I, I needed to know that he was real. The truth is, the constant barrage of delusions had taken a toll on my psyche. Distinguishing between what was real and what was merely a figment of my imagination had become difficult. I had to know Sean was real. I wanted to believe he was, and I would know he was real if only he would speak. Could he not see the anguish in my eyes? Why wouldn't he just utter a single word? I gripped his shoulders tightly, begging him to even part his lips once. He never obliged my only wish. No amount of bribery or pleading could elicit a response from him. All he did was grab my arm, turn towards his room and march towards it. As I followed him, an overbearing sense of dread began to brew within me. I felt my heart intensely pounding in my throat as we entered the room together. There, the entity sat. My head hung low as Sean released from his grasp and trekked towards the being ahead. I too approached it, once again attempting to touch the thing. Preparing to suddenly awake from what I had assumed was another nightmare, I placed my hand on the figure. Only, I didn't wake in my bedroom once again. Instead, it too placed its hand on me and we felt each other's papery frames. Slowly but surely, the details of the being's face were revealed to me. As I looked upon it, I recognised its features, for they were my features too. 
I stumbled backward, watching as the thing with my appearance leaned towards my son, gently kissing his forehead. I ogled the creature, swallowing the oceans of saliva that had built up in my mouth in a single swift gulp. The creature locked eyes with me, and I locked eyes with it. As this occurred, a sense of familiarity washed over me. My mind darted back and forth, unsure of what to make of the situation. That is, until my thoughts inexplicably settled on the memory of the accident on that fateful night. I recalled the blinding lights, the shill cries of fear and suffering. No, there was no more. The overhead traffic light, from which a soft red hue shone in the night sky. My vehicle had passed underneath the light, and then the impact happened. The doctors, had they truly told me my son had survived? They say that there are some moments in our life that we'll remember for an eternity. It was a quote that I wrote back towards the beginning of this text. So then, why couldn't I recall the words of the doctor who told me that Sean was still alive? Could I truly have forgotten? I snapped back into reality, keeping eye contact with the being before me. Only now, Sean was nowhere to be found. The sense of familiarity I felt soon dissipated and was replaced with boiling hatred. I glared at the monster, my palms balling up. I rushed towards it, tackling it to the ground. Before I could react, I began pummeling it with my fists. You're the reason Elizabeth is gone. You're the reason Sean is gone. I'm gonna kill you, I exclaimed, gritting my teeth and continuing my assault on the being. It showed no resistance. It simply allowed me to keep striking it, again and again and again and again and again. I had no plans on stopping. Blood flowed from the thing's face and onto my fists. With every strike, I could feel my body breaking. With every blow, I could sense the light within me begin to extinguish. Yet, I had no plans on stopping. I was going to kill this man for taking what I held dearest to me. At that point, I couldn't even see the thing. Tears had clouded my eyes, blurring my sight. I simply pounded my fists downward, hoping to murder the figure in my fit of rage. I felt a soft tugging on my beige shirt. It was gentle, yet enough to pause my assault. A tiny hand gripped the polyester fabric. My arms fell to my side, and I turned my head, and there he was. My boy stood by my side. I froze, my eyes widening like saucers as I witnessed his lips parting for the very first time. I forgive you, Papa. He smiled at me and embraced me once more. I embraced him too feeling the streams of tears begin to erupt from my eyes. Not wishing to get my tears on his shoulder, I closed my eyes. I soon found that a second pair of arms had wrapped around me. The smooth surface of a ring pressed against my skin. I didn't let go for what felt like hours, but I knew I couldn't hold on for forever. As I opened my eyes, I found myself alone with the figure in what was once Sean's room. I stood up and approached him once more. In one swift motion, I hugged the thing, pulling it close against me. When I let go, the thing vanished from my view. It was over. I fetched the picture frame from the closet and placed it back on my bedside. There stood Sean and Liz, standing beside each other with grins on their faces. In the reflection of the frame, I could see my face besides theirs. I smiled with them for one final time. I know Sean and Elizabeth and the angels are looking from somewhere out there, wishing the best for me. I know they would want me to forgive myself, though doing so isn't going to be easy. I think I'll manage to do it.